Um, thank you very much. So, uh, yes, as was just mentioned, I'm here to make sure you're not snoozing uh, off your lunch. Um, I will try my very best. There was a man here in a maroon jumper somewhere who I made sure I was going to look at and make sure he didn't snooze. I don't know where he's gone now. He's probably taking his jumper off, but uh, uh, never mind. Um, I am supposed to be presenting to you on the very exciting topic of privileged access management worrying the right amount about real risks. I'm not going to do that because it sounds frightfully boring. Um, and you probably have a fair understanding of privileged access and the risks that are facing your companies anyway. Um, so I thought about 15 minutes, what am I going to do with that? My tap dancing skills are pretty poor. So I thought I would do something a little bit different um, and use the two words that my children think are the most offensive words in the English language. Oh, to be so young. Uh, idiot and stupid. The words that you are not supposed to use when standing on a stage in front of an audience like you lot. Um, so, um, it's not just about necessarily stupidity uh, or idiots, this is about users, people. And a great example of that is me. I did this presentation myself and I'm terribly proud about it. One of my crowning glories is the actual background to this because I could not get that blue sort of triangle thing on the right hand slide to actually fit uh, to the edge of the slide. So being a typical day-to-day -day user, I realized you could stretch it over the edge and it works and you don't see the unfinished edges of the presentation. I'm a day-to-day -day user. I'm the sort of person that goes to your companies every single day and does really, really stupid things just in the process of doing their job. So, let's talk about the rise of the idiot. Not my phrase, it's from a comedy program called Nathan Barley, if you've ever seen it, uh, about the horrible people that live in London and the stupid, trendy things they do. Um, many, many years ago, I studied archaeology. I'm familiar with stupidity because I've dug up the bones of people that did really stupid things. The people that ate the first berries that killed them, which meant all the people that came after them didn't eat those berries. Maybe it's not stupidity. Maybe it was. Who knows? I wasn't there. I looked like I was there, but I wasn't. Um, nature's always had ways of dealing with stupidity, or I should say maybe ill-advised. My colleagues and I looked at the different words or ways you could describe stupid, foolish, imbecile, whatever else. None of them sound particularly nice, so we're going to go with ill-advised. With the introduction of technology, you would think there are many different ways in which foolishness or ill-advised people can interact with their doom. Cars being a great example, aeroplanes, brilliant example, and yet stupidity has flourished. Why? Because technology develops medicines and pedestrian crossings and things to keep us all safe. Now, we're so safe that no one uses the pedestrian crossings anymore, they walk out, because if you're the driver, you're gonna stop, otherwise you're, gonna, you're going to jail, Grand theft auto mentality. I can do what I want because it's not my problem, not my fault. These are people that are going about their day-to-day -day jobs and are being kept in an unnaturally long lifespan because of developments in technology, primarily. I know that sounds terribly right-wing and I hope it doesn't come across as such, but ho hopefully you, 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 get, you get the point. Um, can I quantify that? Kind of. In uh, 2007, I was in Milan and the Toyota Prius was named as the town or the city's uh, new eco-friendly taxi of choice. Wonderful innovation, isn't that great? Saving the planet, 10 times increase in incidents injuring pedestrians in the following year. Because if you're Milanese, you walk around with your phone and your coffee and you walk and you use your senses. And if you hear a car coming, you stop. But we've stopped using our senses because we don't need them anymore because ultimately everything's taken care of. That's backed up by the US Department of, De of Transport, who did similar testing around the increase in risks uh, brought about by the, uh, the launch of uh, electric cars. So why do you care? Why do any of us care? Um, I would ask the question, what are these idiots doing when they come to your office? And by idiots, I mean it in the nicest sense. You know that users are users. They will do things that are designed to get their job done efficient, uh, efficiently. But efficiency is the enemy of security in, in many cases. They're going to click on that email, they're going to click on that link. They're going to go to that site because they want to. It's not a generational thing. Stupidity's been around since the you know, day dot. But ultimately, they're going to do things that affect you. And if they didn't, then you wouldn't have been affected by ransomware in the last two years, or you wouldn't have been breached by that shared password last month. Or maybe they're not sitting in your office. Maybe stupid sitting in your managed service provider, and you have no personal relationship with them whatsoever at all. In that case, you've got a real risk because you don't know how stupid they are because you've never met them. So what are they doing when they've got privileged access to your infrastructure? Maybe they're not, maybe they're not foolish, maybe they're just reckless, maybe they don't care. Or maybe they're just underqualified but really well-intentioned members of your team. The reality of privileged access 
is that whilst we can help you protect against North Korean state-funded terror and all that horrible, terrible stuff that everyone talks about, 25% of breaches that took place in the last few years in the UK came from a well-intentioned member of your staff that made an honest mistake. The on-call engineer that tried to fix that problem with a VPN because that, that lawyer in Australia was trying to do some business on a chargeable case and failed the VPN completely closed or failed it completely open. These things happen, and that's the reality of privileged access. What impact do these people have on your business? Depends on their level of access. Most stupid people are like me, obviously, and we have limited toxicity because everything I do wrong is on a laptop that isn't really heavily connected to the critical infrastructure. But if stupid is a member of your IT community or one of your service providers who's been doing really dodgy stuff on their endpoint during their weekends, gambling, bitcoins, streaming media, and has downloaded some kind of infection because 50% of infections still get through your email and your web filtering tools, then you have a real problem. What is that problem? People, passwords, processes, the three Ps. Um, passwords, everyone knows they're wrong and we've all gone to great lengths to control the use of passwords from our day-to-day -day users. A lot of us haven't gone to those same great lengths to control access from their privileged users, their sysadmins, their root administrators, their help desk, their service desk staff, their developers, because they're the guys and gals, sorry, who they are the people who keep the business running, developing new platforms. And you know they know what they're doing, so you kind of, there's an, an implied trust there. That's quite alarming, I would suggest. People do silly things. People do sensible things in the context of what they do day in, day, in, day out. They'll use static passwords because they know them. They'll share passwords so that everyone else can get that job done if they're not around. So if 20 of your people know the same password for that device and something goes wrong, who did it? And if you have to find out, how do you find out? By upsetting 19 people, not ideal. And also passwords are a target for external attacks. Everyone's still awake? Everyone's still awake? Yep, excellent. Passwords are, are perfect targets for malware, sophisticated phishing attacks. So if stupid is interacting with something they shouldn't be, then ultimately your passwords are hugely at risk, not just from insiders, but from people outside that are going to exploit foolishness or ill-advised people. People, they tokenize passwords. A tokenized password is a weaponized password, in my opinion. I came up with that on the plane last night. Um, I'm quite proud of it. Um, people will say, favorite football team, current year, current month. Password change, change the last two digits to current month. That's not OK at all. Full stop. Shouldn't happen. You can have the debate about high entry passwords until you're blue in the face. But changing passwords regularly and making them secure, extremely important, in my opinion. You have the disgruntled employee. I can't solve that problem for you. No one can solve the problem for you because if they can't get access to your systems, they'll stick a brick through your window or they'll print off the data and walk out the door with it. But we can limit the risk of disgruntled employees. And who is the real insider? If it's your outsourced provider who's providing full network controls for you, but they don't have skills to maintain your Palo Alto firewalls, they're outsourcing that skill to a Palo Alto specialist. You've now got a supply chain. That supply chain ends up with typically a highly privileged but lowly qualified member of staff you equally have a problem. And then processes, only as strong as the people that use them. Um, most of our customers have a process for controlling privileged access. And that process is we change passwords every 90 days. Brilliant. Where do you store them? In a spreadsheet. Where's the spreadsheet? That laptop. Brilliant. For resilience, that one over there as well. Yes. OK. It's a process. It is a process. And it's a starting point, to be fair. But it is really, really quite scary. So why does that matter? Because of this. You'll see loads of these. Nothing ever correlates. Um, it's about the quote from Anchorman, 60% of the time it works every time. Uh, you'll see different statistics from different vendors all trying to sell you something completely different. But ultimately, this is a rough approximation of all of them. Over half of the attacks that targeted UK corporations and public sector last year initiated from an external source. Well, that's not stupid people. That's clever people trying to do your business. Competitors, people trying to get money out of you from, through ransomware. But they're exploiting stupidity. They're exploiting the people that don't know better. Maybe not stupidity. People are ill-advised. How many people have heard about you know, CEO fraud? People are targeting the C-level executives who don't necessarily know what this technology thing looks like. If you're getting a FedEx email, it's from FedEx, right? They're your technology partner. They're your uh, transport provider. So you're going to click on that and change your password because FedEx have asked you to. These things happen all the time, and I've seen it myself. Attack vector number two is your disgruntled employees. They don't care if they get caught because they really, really hate you for whatever reason. So they're just going to do whatever they can to affect you. They're really important because they are publicized by horrible people like me. So when someone gets breached, we syndicate it and everyone hears about it. It's terrible practice, but that's simply what happens. 
More concerning is the 16% of attacks that originate from someone who is going to abuse their level of privilege but does not want to get caught. Because these people are in your infrastructure teams, your technology teams, and they're just digging around your networks without you being able to find out why, because maybe you're not as technical as them, technology's moved on, um, you just can't, you can't keep on top of them. Why are they a concern? They get found out when you run a red teaming event, or a penetration test, or a security assessment, and then what do you do about it? Report it? That's a horrible experience. And then finally, attack vector number four, that's your everyday, really well-intentioned members of the team. 23% of your breaches, uh, in theory, are going to come from really, really good people within your team. That's an awful thing to consider, but we're in a position where there is a skill shortage. So we have to be realistic. We're typically allowing people unnecessarily high levels of access to critical infrastructure that they don't, they don't have the skills to manage necessarily. So what do we do about it? We build bigger firewalls and we stick in zero-day malware prevention. Excellent. Well, I'm not sure that necessarily works. The perimeter's gone. It's about identities. And identities, if you can, you can control an identity, then you can control typically what that person is doing. So whether your information's in Azure, AWS, programs in Office 365, financial database uh, on, your, on your network, you can control that access based on the user. The ill-advised people still need to do their jobs. They need to get access to your PCI network, your Windows estate, your financial database systems to maintain them. So how do you do it and control what they can do uh, without risking the increasing vulnerabilities? There are three things that are pretty obvious to do, I think. The first thing to do is invest in some time and maybe some tools, um, maybe some uh, breach assessment and simulation tools to identify what your level of risk is. Are your email systems working? Are your web defenses protecting you? Um, what's the risk of lateral movement? Could a, 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 an attack that starts with malware uh, propagate into my, my server estate, for example? Once you've done that, education. Technology will solve 25% of your problem, but people are still going to find ways of bypassing whatever you put in. So education is obviously essential. And I feel awful. I've been in the cybersecurity market for 20 years, um, and we're still talking about multi-factor authentication. Like, it's been around. Everyone knows how to authenticate and the risk of identities, and yet everyone's still being breached. So something's going wrong. Buying more product isn't necessarily the answer. The final thing I'd mention is enforcing the principle of least privilege. If you only control, if you can control the passwords people are using, you can protect those passwords from misuse and abuse. But if you control the password, but you don't control what people are doing on those target servers, you're only solving half the problem. So the principle of least privilege, um, everyone's familiar with identity and, and how to manage identities. Um, but managing passwords, as I say, only half the problem. Um, we work with companies that have done a great job of authenticating their users, but don't know what they're doing when they get onto their infrastructure. So that's a, a big differentiator in terms of privileged access management. You can have systems and password vaults that manage passwords for you, give you short, good identity assurance. But if you have unfettered access, those under-qualified, overprivileged users are still going to make mistakes on your systems. The disgruntled employee is still going to steal stuff from your systems because they don't care. So consider the ways in which you control what people can do. Application blacklisting, whitelisting being a good, a good example. It's great, but it requires overheads and management in controlling what people can do within the applications. We would argue that you should look at a task-based approach to privileged access. This is the only salesy bit of my presentation. Hopefully, it doesn't offend you too much. But people have different profiles within your organization. A tier three member of your Windows support team needs full RDP access to your Windows estate because they're doing really clever things and fixing things and improving things. Does a tier two engineer in that same team require full RDP access, completely unaudited? Maybe, but maybe you want to record that access so you can prove what they did if something went wrong. And a tier one support engineer in the Windows estate, you really want to give them full native tool access to your Windows environment, that's pretty bonkers in my opinion because they're gonna make mistakes. So why not enforce task-based access where they can only interface with that target device through a series of pre-canned tasks, restarting services, resetting domain account passwords, tasks that require a high level of privilege may not necessarily be complicated, but take time and expose you to risk. If you can lock the access to that level of, of control and, 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 and limited privilege, then that's a very strong position to be in. And if you can do it across not just your Windows estate, your Linux servers, your development environments, your security environment, if you can enforce that same level of access from your managed service providers, then you have governance within your business. This slide shows, typically, nothing evil or bad. There are a no load of people who have an absolute reason to get access to your network and a load of things they have absolute reasons to get access to. But if there's no policy enforcement point, how do you know who's doing what, where, and when? 
You've got an email filtering gateway, you've got a web filtering gateway because you want to know who's doing what, where and when, who's sending an email with the word confidential or a price list on it, who's surfing for gambling sites at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday. We've all gone to great lengths to, to assess that and deal with it, but if you've got privileged users coming in, you know they've come in, but you don't know where they've gone, this is your critical infrastructure. It's called critical for a reason. If you deploy a privileged access solution, um, it's going to sit really as, a, as an inline proxy, a policy enforcement point, and it's going to give you a whole load of additional benefits, integrating with multi-factor authentication for better identity assurance for your privileged users, being able to validate the reasons why people are connecting in to do that piece of work, not just who they are, but why they're doing it. Do you have a change ticket to carry out this piece of work, yes or no? It's also going to give you greater visibility because we can obviously offset all that information and pass it off to your, your, your SIEM tools. Um, that, in a real nutshell, is everything I wanted to talk about. I did just want to just leave this on whilst I take any questions. Really important for me uh, as a member of the cybersecurity community for so long um, is about the heritage and the credibility of, of, of my business, which is Assyrium. Um, Assyrium is a UK-based cybersecurity uh, business. We're based in the Thames Valley, um, hence my wonderful, uh, terrible Middle English accent. Um, we are founded by a, a group of people that founded a technology called Mimesweeper, which is now known as ClearSwift. So if you've ever used Mimesweeper or ClearSwift technologies, the co-founders of this business developed that, that technology. So a long track record of building very credible uh, cybersecurity businesses here in the UK. Um, we are Cyber Essentials accredited. We are registered with the ICO. We have a data protection officer. We eat and sleep and, uh, sleep and breathe the same uh, regulations as yourselves. Um, and the UK is our primary market. It's not a secondary or tertiary market. Everything you guys want is what we, we want to provide. So um, we are an innovator in this space. We are a Gartner cool vendor. We are on the Gartner Magic Quadrant for Privileged Access Management, which is terribly exciting if you like analyst things. Um, but ultimately, we build a very, very easy to deploy solution that helps you protect against this abuse of privileged credentials and the misuse of company infrastructure through well-meaning idiots. Um, that's it. If you get the slide where afterwards my contact details are on the last slide, um, very welcome to, to take any questions you have. And at that stage, I guess I'll open the floor for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, how do you govern your product, given it's now centralized? Are you talking about like a network, like an axis of idiocy? Like where idiots are facilitating other idiots to do idiotic things? I've seen it quite a lot, yeah. The first thing I would do is, I would, if you think you have someone like that in your environment, I would record everything they do, and I'd fire them on day three. <laughs> Next. There's the answer. Again, totally right wing, I do apologise, but it's pretty obvious, right? Um, in, in very simple terms, we act as an inline proxy. So the only way you can get access to the infrastructure you want to get access to is based on whether you have a client or access to a client via a browser. So you have to be provisioned that. So that's the starting point. When you provision all of your servers through Assyrium, even if someone, a, a clever IT person, knows where that server is, we're managing the passwords and changing it every time it's used and encrypting it to AES-256 and randomizing it. So how are they going to interface with it? The idiot that wants to help the idiot do the idiot idiotic things doesn't know the password either because you've separated him from it because we're managing it. So it's not foolproof because nothing is foolproof. Some idiot will find a very clever way of doing something that my idiots haven't worked out yet. Um, that made sense, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, oh. yeah it makes sense. Um, so there's always ways around. But ultimately, it's an inline proxy. If you provision all your service through a, a, a PAM platform as an inline proxy, how do you get something outside of it? And even if you can get to it, how do you know the password? One more. No. Nick, Tim, thank you very much indeed. Thank and you very much. Glad you were uh, bright after your... There you go. Night. There's no snoring either, which is great. So um, <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Cheers.